measurements are not uh, uh, close uh, by Discorded. more than 0.5. Yeah. We had to sit together and measure again. Uh, normal relics are not known. But for coronary diameters in cor uh, conventional angiography uh, is measured all the time. And that is how we put stents in. Mm. Uh, when we want to measure uh, diameter, we measure using that method I showed you before. And we d uh, decide the size of the stent. Um, the only other comparison is uh, we can measure the luminal areas by doing intravascular ultrasound, uh, also called IVAS. Uh, but uh, there, uh, I looked at those normal values and these normal values. Uh, the other normal values are slightly uh, more okay. than what we measure here. I don't know the reason. Sure. Is there any place for post-mortem studies? Uh, they, they, they have been done, sir. They have been done. And uh, they also have proven that uh, South, Korea, uh, South uh, Asians have uh, uh, smaller coronary arteries. But the problem is most of these studies either have very few numbers and also they are not matched. When you do a post-mortem study, it's very difficult to Measure. have a match comparison. Yes. No, uh, no, they are uh, only sixty nine percent were males. Yeah, Dr. Yanacha. It, it could be, but we normally do, yeah. Yeah, actually this is a retrospective study, so yep. we have uh, followed the, the protocol uh, to do, uh, do these measurements. If you do a prospective study, we can do that, but the common practice in doing CT coronary angiography is giving beta blockers to reduce heart rate. You yep. want to maintain it below 60 mm -hmm. if possible, and also um, uh, give vasodilators uh, to, they, then only you see a lesion. And so this these are, these are the patients who manifested cardiovascular diseases, so you take precautions before the invasive procedure, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I concluded saying that the narrowing could be uh, due to a possible atherosclerotic or uh, arteriosclerotic changes taking place during, uh, with aging. Isn't it uh, possible for you to further extend your study to uh, try and exclude these uh, factors like atherosclerotic changes and uh, uh, arteriosclerosis? Yeah, actually, that, that's a very good question because no one at, at the moment know why our people get uh, uh, more coronary artery disease. So uh, again, this was a, whether it was a smaller by, by genetic means or whether they are early atherosclerosis, we don't know. Uh, by this study, uh, by uh, using CT coronary angiography, it is difficult to m um, have an idea about atherosclerosis. But if you do, um, if you do intravascular ultrasound, it, we can we can quantify an atheroma. Uh, uh, maybe you know when we get chance uh, to do that, uh, uh, it's an excellent uh, study to do. So do do you? Uh, uh, do you have any idea? I think, I think, I think my, my impression is that you should start with a young age and then see how what, what happens sexually. Yeah. If, they are, if they are born with a smaller coronary arteries, then of course you will see the difference in the young age group. If it is due to atherosclerosis, then you find only difference only in the old age groups. Yeah. And until you find a non-invasive way of assessing the coronary artery lumen, I don't think you can subject these people for the invasive because there's a certain amount of mortality, isn't it? That's right. There's a mortality yeah. and the morbidity associated with coronary yeah. angio, so until you find an non-invasive method of checking that, I think that that will be a problem. So the average age group is somewhere around 50, 52. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the time you see all yeah. sorts of changes. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, the patients. Now, there's an indi there are indications uh, for CT coronary angiography. They are... I mean, we do CT coronary angiography to exclude coronary arteries rather than yeah. diagnose. So these are the people with atypical pains with risk factors who came. We wanted to prove that they don't have coronary artery disease. That's how uh, a younger age group uh, was, uh, you know, had to be 
collected like that. Okay. I think we'll get on with the next paper. And uh, the next paper is titled uh, Maximum Safe Contrast Volume During Catheterization. And the authors are Namal Vijaysinghe, Sonia Cherian, and Gerald Devlin. Uh, is over to you, Namal, again. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, again. And uh, now this is another problem with coronary angiography. Uh, there's this uh, big entity of complication, co uh, complication called radio contrast induced nephropathy. Uh, simply means that when you inject uh, contrast uh, material, con contrast media, uh, uh, intravascularly, whether it is intra-arterial or intra-venous, uh, uh, they can cause uh, acute renal impairment. Uh, so uh, that is a very well uh, documented and known uh, complication of coronary angiography. Uh, and, uh, and actually that is the third commonest cause in, in, in hospital acute renal failure. Uh, only comes second uh, or third to uh, infections and, and drug-induced uh, renal failure. Now, there are so many uh, uh, factors that can uh, predispose a patient to uh, contrast-induced nephropathy. The, the most important ones are acute uh, underlying renal impairment, diabetes, uh, um, using uh, uh, intraarterial balloon pumps, and, uh, uh, and uh, 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 hypotension, and so on. Uh, however, higher contrast volumes using during these uh, procedures also were well documented and was proven before by multiple studies. Now our aim was because this is a common problem in the cath catheterization laboratory uh, because we don't know in uh, high risk patients how much uh, contrast to use to do a better quality study and to get all the information we need. We, we have to use a certain amount of contrast volume. But at the same time, if you use more volume, uh, we are predisposing the patient for acute renal impairment or uh, for uh, uh, contrast nephropathy. So we need to, we wanted to strike a balance somewhere and find uh, the maximum safe contrast volume to use uh, in high risk patients or in, in, in that uh, case, in every patient. So what we did was, uh, again, this was a prospective conduct a study in uh, Waikato Hospital New Zealand during my cardiology training. And uh, we uh, formulated this equation. Where this was actually derived from a study done in 1980s, where at that time there was no EGFR calculations done routinely. So they had uh, uh, used uh, uh, whether the patient has uh, diabetes, their gender, and uh, it was a complex equation. But we knew by experience and, and from this study that if we can find some factor that can represent all the risk factors uh, that can predispose a patient for co uh, contrast nephropathy, uh, we can formulate a simple formula that everyone can remember. Uh, you may understand that when you work in the cath lab, we, we, we can't uh, use calculators and, and all these complex ways of um, uh, getting, a, getting an answer. But if you know uh, the, the five times table, you can easily calculate this. So we thought the EGFR is the best way that can, that best factor that will represent the age, the, the diabetic status, the renal impairment and everything. Uh, I, I can uh, show you later on in my slides uh, 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 the relevance of that. So we thought, and also to get this number of five, we, we calculated, the, the, we analyzed the large database using the numbers from one to 10. So we, we, because it is easy to do nowadays using computer programs, we use one, two, three, four, and we got a positive uh, value in the pilot study using only the number five. So there are EGFR, there, there are two calculations, as you all know, uh, uh, Korotkov and Gold uh, uh, equation and MDRD equation. But this is the, the equation widely used in New Zealand. We use this uh, for this study. 
to calculate the EGFR of the patients. And this is the definition of the uh, uh, radio contrast induced nephropathy. That is, from your baseline creatinine, if the creatinine goes up by 25% within three to five days of the, the procedure, or if there's an absolute increment of 0.5 milligrams per deciliter within three to five days, we diagnose those patients as having uh, renal, uh, sorry, contrast nephropathy. Uh, by the three to five days is that there are other causes of uh, renal impairment after cardiac catheterization, such as uh, cholesterol embolization, that occur uh, later, uh, maybe a couple of weeks later. And uh, there are various types of uh, uh, contrast material, but to, to do this study, you, uh, it is uh, uh, difficult to analyze if you use uh, different types of uh, contrast material, so we use only idoxenol. Now, this is a, 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 a precautionary measure we do normally uh, to prevent uh, contrast nephropathy in high-risk patients. So high-risk patients, are if they have diabetes, if they uh, have underlying renal impairment, or else if they are likely to require uh, a higher volume of contrast. So we pre-treated them as, uh, with normal saline. So uh, giving normal saline infusions uh, preprocedurally is the best way of preventing contrast-induced nephropathy. That is done uh, across all the uh, imaging uh, uh, techniques by radiographers as well as by, uh, by radiologists as well as by cardiologists. But we all have protocols in every cardio cardiac catheterization laboratory uh, when, uh, regarding when to use uh, periprocedural hydration. We don't normally use it for everyone. You may wonder why we don't, because in other countries, uh, it's very difficult to keep uh, patients over a longer period. So we want to get them down, do the procedure, and discharge them as early as possible. If you keep a patient a few hours more, uh, hospital is losing uh, a, a large amount of money. So uh, uh, we, in, in our hospital protocol, we use periprocedural hydration only for diabetic patients, and when the creatinine is uh, more than 1.3 grams per deciliter, and if the patient uh, undergoes coronary intervention, where you use more um, uh, more contrast. So the patients who who are high risk got a bolus of uh, uh, 500 milliliters of normal saline uh, prior to the procedure, and if they ended up requiring more uh, contrast uh, after. Uh, percutaneous coronary intervention, uh, they were given uh, normal saline, 100 milliliters per hour, for six hours. Now, obviously, patients who died, there are a couple of patients uh, come with acute myocardial infarctions, if to, even after successful stenting, they die. Uh, or uh, patients who had to uh, undergo urgent uh, coronary bypass surgery within the first three days, because there's hardly any time for us to diagnose this uh, contrast nephropathy. And also, Patients who had to come back to the cath lab for a repeat procedure were excluded from the study. And uh, also patients who, had re uh, who, who undergoes renal dialysis, we can't diagnose uh, nephropathy because they don't have functioning kidneys. So they were excluded as well. However, uh, the, there were patients with single kidneys, and, they, and, and uh, at least two patients had uh, ha had, had uh, um, renal transplants. So during that period of study, we had 661 eligible patients. The mean age is uh, about 64 years, as you can see. And we calculated their EGFR. We, we, uh, everyone, their radiation dose, their contrast volume, all recorded in the cath lab. It is just like giving uh, normal cell to see the because in other countries here, Same amount of money. There, if you admit them overnight, the procedure, you lose about say, $400 of uh, worth money. Cost exercise. Yeah. Okay. Right. We'll move on to the other paper. Thank you very much. And. Uh,